Next on the stage is uh, Professor Athena Markopoulou from University of California at Irvine to talk about uh, Ant Monitor. Is my microphone working? Can you hear me? Can you hear me well? Yes. No? Nope. Yes. That's it. Okay, so um, uh, the name of our project is Ant Monitor, and we, we call it this way for, uh, to honor Peter the Antitter, the mascot of UCI. So this is the joint work of uh, several people in my group, including Anastasia Shuba and Janusz Varmarken, who are here, and my former students, Anne Lee and Minas Joka, and Manuel Berti and Simon Lankov. So the problem statement is pretty much the same with the one we heard before. So uh, we all know how phones are um, uh, important. They have access to our own data, our photos, our uh, personal information, and they occasionally talk to a service over, uh, over the network to uh, uh, provide us what we want. And sometimes they talk to, uh, to, uh, to destinations we don't intend to communicate, like uh, trackers and ads and all these things we heard before. So. Um, the goal is to uh, um, provide the user with uh, visibility and control over um, what is going on on, uh, on their phone. And there are different ways to go about it. Some people go, they use an OS-based approach or they modify the OS and they have a lot of information. The approach that we uh, follow and other projects actually fund, found, uh, funded by DDL follow is to look at the uh, traffic that comes out of the device. And the assumption is that whatever behavior that device has, either legitimate or malicious, it will manifest itself uh, through these packets that we can inspect. So this is a high-level goal, to uh, look at, mon uh, at network traffic um, uh, in and out from, uh, from the mobile device and inform the user about what's going on, give him control to take some actions, and eventually um, uh, analyze data on a large scale and uh, make the software available to the community. Now, in building such a system, there are many conflicting requirements. So to get users, this system has to be attractive to users, meaning you cannot ask to root the phone, you cannot have low performance. You, uh, the user must be um, uh, motivated to install the app and so on. Uh, it has to uh, um, lend itself to crowdsourcing. So that rules out a, a bunch of approaches, and that's why I think so many of the projects we hear follow this uh, VPN-based approach, which is the only way today that you can capture packages on the phone without rooting the phone. So what I want to do for the rest of the talk is to tell you what we have so far, what is the system we have built, the Antomonitor system, uh, what is the thinking process we went through for the design and uh, why it, it, we think its performance is actually quite good, and then focus on its application to, uh, uh, to privacy uh, and transparency, and then highlight where we are going with this project in the next year. So, uh, okay, goal, monitor packets in and out of a device. There are two ways to do that using a VPN uh, service. You can do that with a classic VPNs where you, need, you route your, your packets through a, a VPN server in the middle. And that's the, um, um, the approach that previous projects have taken. Um, I don't know if uh, is, uh, David Joffn is here. Uh, so his, his prior project from uh, Medl and Recon follows that approach. So this is fine. And this is also the approach we followed in an early version of this, uh, of this um, uh, uh, system, uh, the Antmonton Client Server. But it's supposed to help uh, protect privacy while redirecting traffic through the middle server and while not having access to rich information on the device. So the next uh, reasonable, um, so we did that for in the first version of the software uh, using standard VPN service and uh, the middle server, the middle, um, the VPN server for uh, routing. Um, and, but even at that point, we actually put some extra functionality on the client to allow for, uh, to collect information from the client and allow real-time prevention and uh, of, of privacy leaks. Now, um, then we realized this is not the most graceful way to go about it. We could get rid of the server in the middle and you could do it at the, on the client side. So um, you could avoid the, ins the inspection in the middle server and capture all traffic of the device. There are a number of uh, approaches that have followed that. There are some apps on, uh, on Google Play, like an early version of T-Packet Capture, or some firewall apps that they use this VPN-based service. There are um, earlier projects like uh, Privacy Guard and Haystack that follow that approach as well. And that was the approach that we took in the uh, Ant-Monitor mobile-only approach uh, ourselves. 
So we no longer need a mid server for routing. We may or may not use a log server if the, if the user opts in to log data or metadata. So now it turns out um, this uh, high level idea is not so easy to implement efficiently. If you don't have the VPN server in the middle, you need to translate all your connections on the device, have a proxy on the device, basically. Um, and that is not easy to do at high speed uh, for many reasons. So it took a long time, actually, to make the performance of this, uh, of this system um, what uh, we wanted. So we spent a lot of time on the translation of the connections. Um, and I think it's too specific for this audience, actually. But um, so. <laughs> We had, had to put a lot of work on how we read from the tune interface um, because it does, provide, does not provide an interrupt-based um, mechanism, so we had to make that efficient. We had to be efficient about how we read and write on both sides, on the sockets and on the, on the tune interface. Um, how we do our, um, our um, deep packet inspection for privacy. Um, so we can, I can spend a whole talk just, just on that. Actually, that goes on a CS advancement exam. But the end result of this is a lot of fine tuning and um, um, careful software engineering. Uh, on optimizing every single aspect that we could in this, uh, in this diagram, uh, we think that paid off. So uh, here's the performance of the, of the current tool. Um, so we compare um, the, the, the system that we have to, uh, now to other mobile-only approaches, to client service approaches, and to no VPN. So in terms of different metrics, so our uh, uh, throughput performance is quite high. Uh, so it's almost as close as um, uh, the raw device and almost double from other approach on the uh, downlink. And uh, it's quite high on the uplink as well. The uplink is the one that matters because that's the one where you actually inspect the traffic that goes out. And that translates to benefits in battery because you finish with your uh, um, uh, higher throughput means less, less time spent. Um, and the, the other, the other um, performance metrics are comparable. So. Then we looked into more detail in our own implementation. When is the most performance hit comes in? It turns out the routing itself is quite efficient. The, um, the logging is efficient. The biggest hit comes at, deep, at the deep packet dispensation when you look for strings that they are uh, leaking. Um, and, but still is quite smart, so uh, quite fast. So um, our, our delay is in the order of 10 to 25 milliseconds per packet, which is crucial. It's not only detail if you want to do a real time inspection and take some action. Otherwise, if you don't have that type of performance, you cannot do it in real time. You can keep reports and so on, but cannot take um, action in real time. So, um, so, um, so today we have this, uh, this tool that we think it performs quite well. We're happy with its performance. There are different ways you can use this tool. In the context of DTL, I'm going to describe only the privacy applications of it. You can also see that it's actually a powerful measurement, performance measurement tool, but let's focus on the privacy applications. So what we have built so far is, a, um, is an application that where you can set up what is that you want to monitor if it's, a, if it's a, a transmit out of your device. So we have predefined some, um, uh, um, some piece of information that we think is important. The user can go and also specify custom filters. And then as, a, as the traffic goes out of your device, Ant Monitor is looking and capturing them. Uh, we give some options for the user to take uh, on real time. You can allow this uh, text to go out of the device. You can block it. But that may destroy the application, or, uh, or I mean, uh, um, and or we can hash the information, replace the string with an equal size string. So these are what you can set up uh, in real time. Um, no, so eventually, you can go and look at the reports of what uh, was uh, uh, transmitted out for each application, how many times it happened. You can zoom in and see the details of what went where. Um, so and in real time, you can, uh, you, you can actually see this pop-up. If you are interested in the device ID location, let's say, and you see it leaking, it will, it will interrupt you and it will tell you, OK, this is happening. Take an action. What are you going to do? And then they will you remember the choice for later on. The other thing that we, uh, we uh, user currently can do with the, with the app we, um, we have developed is you can, uh, can have real-time visualization of the traffic. So if you go to the uh, real-time um, option, you will see a, a real-time diagram uh, which shows what apps talk to, uh, to what destinations. As long as the TCP connection is active, uh, you will see something like that. Uh. 
So as packets get transmitted and the TCP connections uh, become active and inactive, you will see this being updated. You can click on the nodes to see where your traffic is going. Um, so uh, here, let's say that we go out of our monitor app and we start another application. Let's say we open Chrome and we go to a website that clearly opens a TCP connection. You download some, uh, download some data. I speak faster than the, <laughs> the browser can download. Um, okay, and you can see that the new connection being uh, displayed uh, uh, real time, and then it will disappear when the connection is closed. So this is the capability we currently have on the, on the app, and um, we did not actually open up this uh, widely until a few days ago, because I want to make it available for, for DTL. While we were testing and developing uh, the software, we actually collected uh, data just between ourselves, between our research group at UCI, uh, around 15 people with the install, so um, that's me. That's uh, Anastasia, that's other people who contribute the data over time. So this is by no means an exhaustive study. Uh, it's a few users. As we were testing, we're also were looking at what kind of findings you see there. So we, we saw a lot of uh, pri um, uh, PIIs being transmitted out of uh, several apps, uh, many times over the period of uh, uh, six months that we were monitoring that, uh, going to the expected analytics and, um, and ad servers. Um, so some of them are not really leaks, they needed to operate. For example, um, speed test should transmit the location, uh, WhatsApp should transmit the phone number, um, uh, but they should not transmit in plain text. Um, and it also costs a lot of data to the user. So as, uh, as Nasir said before, it actually costs and it eats up your data plan. Um, and then there's a long discussion, like, what does this add on top of, 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 of permissions? Like, if you look at the permissions of your app, you know that what uh, access you are giving. So the answer to that is, first, uh, not, every user, not all users pay attention to permissions. And second, due to inter-app um, uh, communication, there are ways, actually, to that uh, your, um, an app that does not have the permissions get access to um, some piece of information. So where would we go from here? To come back to the question that uh, we heard uh, in the, in the, at the end of the last talk. So so far, what do we have? We have a tool that has a real-time detection and prevention of uh, if you give it a string, you can see if it goes out. And that can be useful if you know what you're looking for and you have an honest but curious adversary. But what next? So the, I think the interesting next step for this type of work is more behavior analysis, an automated way to um, um, uh, classify flows that, have, uh, that, that uh, expose uh, PIIs based on network level features and uh, using user feedback and all the blacklists that we had before. So it would be nice if we can actually automatically separate what is a legitimate use of the app versus a, a leak. Um, um, it's not clear if this type of methods can apply real time. Can you apply this uh, um, uh, um, classifiers in real time? Should you train locally on your phone or should you train globally uh, where you collect the data? So that's one interesting direction. And that can, uh, put, uh, moving from string match, fast string matching to uh, learning and classification. And that can also help encrypt the traffic. Uh, there are ways to, uh, to intercept the, um, TLS and decrypt the traffic, look for PIIs and then re-encrypt it. That, that is the way other apps have done it, that's the way we do it currently. But that's not a long-term solution. It would be good to inspect encrypted flows and decide based on that uh, um, whether there's a potential PII leak. And more generally, it would be good to have automated ways um, to uh, uh, classify uh, and do anomaly detection at different granularities per flow, per app, or per the entire device. We have taken some first steps in that direction when we use network level features to uh, uh, classify flows and actually and even, even users. So I'm going to show you two uh, very crude examples. So here's an example when we look at our data set from the uh, six months uh, uh, study and we try to classify flows to, uh, to the apps that they were supposed to, uh, to belong to. So we look at network level, classic network level features like packet size, the arrival times, uh, destination and so on and try to use that to identify what, what app this flow belongs to. Uh, so he, the results were uh, pretty good. So we were able to go as high an F1 score as 93%, depending on what features you train on and what if you, if you train specifically for the user or globally, which is a good result uh, given that um, other approaches that use uh, a payload, like HTTP headers, 
they achieve lower numbers. Uh, the reason why with off-the-shelf machine learning uh, 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 we were able to, to have such a good classification is that because the mobile-only approach has access to ground truth on the device. You know what apps you are running, so you can do um, uh, um, good training of your models. Uh, so there's an inherent advantage in uh, doing learning on top of the mobile-only uh, only approach. Um, so uh, the next question is, can you actually classify users based on what you see on the traffic? And this is, a, again, a very crude, uh, crude example. So this is um, different people in my group. Uh, this is Anastasia with two phones. That's Anne with uh, five installs. And these are other people. So it's a very simple example. When we trained on uh, different periods of uh, eight users, uh, and we, uh, we tested on um, all 11 users in different periods. So most people get classified to themselves. Um, this seems like a mistake, but if you look at closure, it's not a mistake. This is the same person, Anne, using different phones, so it actually did classify the user. Before it profiled the user, and this is Anne looking like Anastasia. That seems like, seems like a, uh, a mistake too, but at that time, they were working on the same things, running the same tests, and so the phones did look the same. So this is very preliminary, but it shows how powerful um, uh, use, learning using network level features is to um, um, to build models that may be useful for PII leaks or for, uh, for other anomalies. So there are two uh, directions we want to take this, uh, this project forward. One is a methodological and uh, moving more on the behavioral analysis and the learning part that I just described. It can be useful for PII um, uh, exposure detection, for working on encrypted flows and for anomaly detection. And the other direction is, um, so far, we haven't deployed this app at scale. And as Nico, and Nico said and others know very well, it's not easy to make an app popular. So how do we get about actually getting users to, to use it and collect some uh, data that you can do analysis on? So I have, uh, we have uh, three ideas about this. So the one idea is to make the app available. Uh, we, ha we, have, we have not opened it up at the Google Play. You can actually download it and, and see the demo. Right now, we don't collect any, any logs because um, after all the detailed interaction, I'm much more aware about what it means to collect data from people. So if you, if you uh, choose to use our app, it will you just uh, use the real-time uh, information and will collect no data. Now, realistically speaking, it's very difficult to make an app popular. Whoever has tried to do that knows how difficult it is. So we can get data for a paper, but it's unlikely that will be uh, widely spread. So here comes the second idea. Same functionality provided as an SDK. So the same functionality I described, we have packaged it in SDK. Uh, right now, we have the equivalent of a pickup library available. So if you want to uh, inspect network traffic to do some processing on top of that, uh, you don't need to reinspect the wheel on, or invent the wheel on how to do this efficiently. You can use our SDK and do extra functionality on top of that. And we'll, it will soon make the privacy SDK available as well. And eventually, this should be an open, open source code. But we hope that this SDK will help the adoption by third party um, um, apps within the research community or even um, outside. So I will stop here and I would like to thank DTL for their support and interactions. Thank you, fantastic. Thank you. Well, questions on the floor? Elaborate a little more on your ideas about inferring PII on encrypted traffic. So, what are the techniques you guys are? Yeah. Looking at? So, if you if uh, there's another uh, DTL funded project, Recon, right? So, you train on network level. Oh, actually, they train on, with payload with HTTP headers, and uh, you have some ground truth. What um, um, based on network level features of the f or even payload level uh, features of the um, flow, uh, can you classify whether this flow leaks PIIs or not? So you're looking at like packet sizes and stuff? Yeah, so we look at packet sizes, uh, TCP headers, destination, where the traffic is going. Uh, if you want to use um, more information like HTTP uh, headers, you can do even better. So you train on some part for which you have a uh, ground truth that the information leaked, and then you test on uh, other flows. There is no reason why this idea cannot be applied on encrypted traffic. So my concern is like there is increasing use of Quick, which is proposed by Google and does transport layer encryption. And they also have, I think, some padding and stuff, so which will make these kind of classifiers um, No, less that's, that's the beauty of actually using network level features, because you look at things that they cannot, they are not hidden by encryption. Um, so uh, these things cannot be hidden. Packet size, the arrival times, destination where your traffic is going, they will always be there. So I think that's the most powerful long-term approach, even more powerful than training on HTTP, head, uh, and HTTP headers. 
Other questions? Well, I have a comment. I, I, I think with the, with the grants that we funded last year and the ones uh, this year as well, we already started building uh, very interesting software and, uh, and now I think it's time to consolidate in different levels. First of all, see the overlap between the different pieces of software, start comparing them, start fusing together the data to see where, uh, which points you agree and which not, which is, I guess, the next step in terms of validating these tools because none of these tools is perfect, right? So we need to do this as well. Uh, and then it gives a very good uh, opportunity to uh, try to publicize and get, uh, get users for all the tools, basically, right? So it, it doesn't make sense to reinvent the wheel and do it again and again. We should um, target our, our efforts to get users for, for most of these tools in a way consolidating in, a, in an application suite that, suite that will do multiple things for the user that wants to use it. And then uh, do what you said, uh, open up the data for others, because building the tools is uh, time consuming, it's expensive, it's difficult, uh, and then typically people uh, answer just a few questions using the data they, they collected, but there could be many others that cannot build the tools but would, uh, would be there to analyze the data and ask uh, interesting questions. So it's something that we'll try to do in the coming year. Thank you, Athena.